So thank you very much for coming. Terminology, as I often say, is a bit of a Cinderella subject. So it's lovely to see plenty of people. What we're going to do this morning is um, look at, at our learning objectives. Then just some refresher stuff. I know when um, Graham, and Graham particularly asked me to, if I'd be willing to do this, it's not supposed to be terminology training. But I'm really conscious that unless you have a very good grasp of the fundamentals, going on to doing the practical stuff can be very wobbly. Um, my husband, some of you know him, has been driving a powerboat now for probably 20 years, uh, quite expertly. We do a lot of playing with toys in, in water, and not like you do here in the States where you're on the lakes. We're on the sea, and sometimes you've got someone in the water and you can't see them because the waves are so high. We just get on with that. So he's quite experienced at picking people up when they've fallen off the wakeboard or whatever. But um, he finally did some formal uh, Royal Yachting so Association training for powerboat driving uh, four weeks ago. And so he now has a, a certificate. And it's one of those things where actually he's got equal with me. Normally, I'm trying to get equal with him. But I, I've had that certificate for mm, 10 years now. And I said to him at the end of the, the two days, did you learn anything? Anything new? Did you find any bad habits you'd got? And he said, well, no, I don't think so. But it was really valuable to do. And then the next weekend was a holiday in, in the UK, and we were out on, with the children, with our grown-up children for four full days out on the water. And at the end of it, he said, it's really interesting. I didn't think I learned anything in that powerboat course. But the way I'm handling the boat is suddenly different. The way I, I'm thinking about what I'm doing is suddenly different. So if, particularly in these first two bits, if all I'm doing is confirming what you already know, I'm going to trust that that has value for you in confirming your understanding, giving you that sense of security of, I really know what I I'm talking about here, um, so that you are able to deal with discussions about terminology, and in the end, build better value sets as a result of it. Then we'll look uh, more closely at using terminology in FHIR, and some considerations for code uh, system selection and value set definition. Melva said to me that somebody looked at sort of building value sets yesterday, which is good. I want to look a bit more at some of the, the pros and cons of what and why. So that's what I, I hope to cover. Is that going to, I, I have to say, Graham was very brave in letting me do this, because sometimes I'm a bit um, iconoclastic. I haven't got a good sense of whether that's going to meet your needs, but I'll, I'll come back to that in a minute. First of all, for those of you who don't know me, I'd like to introduce myself. Um, so my name is Julie. I just want a show of hands. Julie is the current chair of the Terminology Authority. This is a binary question, yes or no? Yes, yes. Actually, that, that one is correct. OK, hands up for yes. Julie rides a red Harley Davidson motorbike. I'm really sorry, guys. I did ride a blue Suzuki, but... I've recently come back from some, um, um, some spiritual exercises, some sort of mind, deep mindfulness training, and one of the things that I had to do was, was rationalize and, and simplify life. And I got home and I looked at my motorbike, and, oh, Julie, you're 56, is this right? And you know, two days later, this guy knocked on my door, our door, and said, and, and he looked at me and he said, uh, um, I go through this area regularly, and I've, I've noticed the motorbike doesn't get used very much. And I could tell he was trying to say, is your husband interested in selling it? <laughs> and I said, actually, I'm the owner. And he went, oh, right. <laughs> so, you know, two days, I thought, that's a sign. So, unfortunately, I no longer ride a motorbike. Facil vocabulary facilitator, yes, no? Yes, thank you. 
and also for the pharmacy um, work group. So I do work in this area quite a lot. Right, Julie spent the night in a builder skip in Exeter. Exeter is where I live. Did I or didn't I? Hands up for yes. Graham definitely thinks yes. You want to believe it. To be fair, Hugh got me out after a while. Yes, sir. Oh, what is it in, what is it in the US? If you're having work done on your house, the builders... T a dumpster. So I, I don't ask how I got into it. I'm not even sure how I got into it. But I, I didn't spend the night in it. My husband did, rec re did rescue me. So do I... I'm a, Julie is a consultant to Snowmed CT. Yes, I am. I've been privileged to do that for the last couple of years. So I have a reasonably in-depth knowledge of that quite challenging but very, very valuable terminology. Right. Have I worked in the Brussels Red Light District? So does that translate? <laughs> Brussels City in Belgium, Red Light District, yes? Okay. Hands up for yes. Oh, there's a few brave souls that say yes. It doesn't say what you did. Exactly, it doesn't say what I did. And yes, um, I was there with a, a volunteer agency. So, and I really enjoyed it. So, it a... <laughs> right, just a bit more personal stuff. Julie has three children. Sorry, actually, I have two and two. We're a blended family, so I have two. My husband has two, so that's not right. We have four. Um, and uh, they never seem to quite grow up. If one has returned home, it's, it's the, um, the boomerang generation. Right. Um, so HL7, obviously, I'm, I'm around. Do I work in ISO? Yes, I do. Um, I've been privileged to be involved in a couple of ISO standards, one of which... Um, we also work with in HL7. Right, come on, Graham and Lloyd. Julie would choose an evening working on data types against an evening working on the beach. No? Now, both of you, can you remember a meeting in Pumarand? Yes. Did Hugh and I come to that meeting rather than go for a walk on the beach? No, we didn't do it at the same time. We chose to come to a meeting on data types rather than go for a walk on a beautiful beach. So that just shows you what a sad geek I am. <laughs> so who are you? I, and I'm used to working with small groups, and this is a bit of a larger group, so I haven't got time to go all around all of you and what your learning objectives are for this, but I would like to ask how many in this room are vocabulary facilitators, either for a work group or for a, a project? Two. So all of the rest of you are working on terminology imp and implementation guides, but are not actually formal vocabulary facilitators. Do you know who the formal vocabulary facilitators are for your project? You do? Good. I saw one. How about and others? Anyone owning up to not knowing? OK, so if <laughs> one takeaway from this training, please engage with your vocabulary facilitator. It's, it's really important. I don't know how many of you are familiar with the skills framework for the information age that tries to, as health informaticists, we're, you know, we're a new profession. It's only existed for 10 to 20 years. So we haven't got uh, masses of um, professional background. And I know there's more in the States where you can do master's degrees and so on, and there's very little in, in other places. But you know, the various organizations have tried to put things together. Um, the SFIA, Bloom's Taxonomy of, of Education Objectives. And if you put them together, you can build this matrix of understanding and applying you know, the verbs of what you can do when you, you're able to do all these different um, 
things. And when it comes to writing IGs, fire IGs, or any other guidance for actual implementation, taking something from theory to practice, we're going quite a long way into the matrix. We're at three, four, five, and six. You know, you, you need to be able to apply and, and assemble and arrange, organize, and actually even on into argue, <laughs> which is, is beyond where we are. And I don't know if you, how many of you are familiar with Malcolm Gladwell's um, theory of expertise, you know, having studied some of the, um, like the Beatles and um, Bill Gates from Microsoft and the, the skills and things. And he, he goes at something like 10,000 hours to be really proficient at what you're trying to do. So we're not going to make that in three hours. And I have to say that some of the research coming out, you know, post that 10,000 hours is, is, is saying, you know, it's not necessary. And this morning I was thinking, gosh, have I done 10,000 hours? I certainly haven't billed for 10,000 hours. Um, I, I suspect over the years I probably am near that. Uh, and I'm still not, in any sense, to my mind, truly an expert. And I think... You know, so one takeaway message, get to know your vocabulary facilitator, use them, engage them. Another one is, this is something that is, that needs working at. It's not something you can turn up and do quickly and expect for it to be um, really flowing and, and excellent. So the sorts of objectives that I've set today about being confident, I was saying about Hugh and the power rope training, I would like you to see you going away really confident in the principles of terminology in healthcare. Codes, code systems, value sets, what they are, how they fit together. We're very poor at saying how they fit together and how to use them and identify and reference them. Have a good understanding of code system selection what to choose and why. Not just what, but why. And similarly for value sets, how, when, and why you're making the sorts of choices that you're making. What I'm not going to cover, and I don't know if anyone else is going to do, is the full explanation of the um, content logical definition of a value set. I can just about get my head around it. I certainly can't teach it in three hours. Um, terminology mapping, which I know is part of FIRE, but is a whole other topic that, that needs deep, uh, deep dive. And the use of terminology services or terminology servers, again, which FIRE has taken forward, but those are things I'm not going to cover this morning. And apologies if you were hoping for them. Come and badger me afterwards. So I have a couple of questions for you that maybe at the end... Um, you'll be able to reflect back on. What's more important, the code system or the value set? Hands up for code system. Oh, several. Hands up for value set. A few more. Important. And important when? I just put the question up to see whether anyone would actually dig into it. Because there are different ways to answer that. So that, that's valuable. Important to who and important when. And hopefully those sorts of questions will become more important. Is an extensionally designed value set better than an intentionally defined one? And if you don't know what that means, don't worry. Hands up for intentionally. Ooh, nobody likes those. How, hands up for extensionally. Nobody likes those either. What's the context? That actually is the key question. You cannot answer that question without the context. That's why I'm throwing them out at the beginning. Should we allow free text instead of a coded concept? Yes, says Graham. Yes, says Lloyd. Yes, says Lisa. Julie says, hmm, depends on the context. And which is the best binding strength to use? Do you have a favorite? I like examples. Graham likes example. 
exemplar. You can't implement it exemplar, can you, Graham? So, you like extensible. And there are pros and cons both ways. And you know, if we answer, if we, if I ask you these questions at the end, we, I hope, we would still have the same debate, because it is all about understanding the context and finding the right thing for your context, and having some flexibility to be able to debate and compromise, which is something I'm not very good at. Oh, and do you have a favorite Semino Desideratum? Do you even know what the Semino Desideratum? No. No, that's fine. If you don't know, you will at the end. And I wondered if I had a favorite, and I think I do, and I will tell you when we get there. HL7 exists to share data meaningfully. Do you play football? Sure, I play football. And do you know, we were in the bar last night, and I looked up, and I thought, they're playing football. And I looked, and it said, soccer. <laughs> you know, we are here to share data meaningfully. And even as human beings, with all our intuition, this is hard. This is really hard. And computers are significantly worse than humans. I have a picture here of whom? Stephen Hawking. And this SNOMED code, which of course you all know off by heart, is for motor neurone disease. When I first got into ser terminology seriously a, a few, and, and sharing data meaningfully a few years ago, well, many years ago, because this was a discussion at the primary school gate with another mum, and I was explaining to her what, what I was doing about building information models and putting terminology in them to share data meaningfully. And she said to me, I saw a patient this morning in my clinic. He came on his own with a referral letter from his, his primary care physician. And I'm going to be writing back, I have written back to that primary care physician. And this is what, I'm going, this is what I've said. Thank you for sending me your patient this morning. I would like to see him again, urgently, with his partner, his significant other. I share your concerns, and we need to uh, make a formal diagnosis and put a care plan in place. Could I code that to a diagnosis of motor neurone disease? No, but both the sender and the receiver knew what they were talking about. So we have limitations, and our computers are significantly worse than we are. But having said that, using terminology well will make an enormous difference to allow us to express that meaning over space and time. I could not take the, uh, um, the letter that my friend wrote back to the GP and use it in any sort of analysis, in any sort of um, how many patients have we got in our area with motor neurone disease. It just wouldn't do it. So we need to recognize when uh, a controlled terminology would really help us, because if I search for this SNOMED code and all its descendants, I will know, how, in a diagnosis field, I will know how many patients I've got. But again, it's context. What can we do? What can't we do? Knowing what we can't do and accepting it when we need text. Knowing what we can do and doing it well. And that's what I really want to, to focus on. If I can press the right buttons. So why bother with terminology? Why not just use text? Well, obviously, Text can be very rich, and as I've just, the example I've just quoted, much too nuanced. Um, 
And it's hard to fit it into any information model. And I'm going to use, you know, fire resource to me is, is another information model without duplication. This is a classic from something I was working with just last week in my field of medicines. It's a product label. Um, and this is in what we call special precautions and warnings for use. It's not in the contraindications section. But heck, when you read it, that looks to me like a contraindication um, for, for um, patients with tuberculosis shouldn't use this drug. But it's not in the contraindication section. And if I put you know, a reasonably simple NLP through that, it probably won't code it as a true contraindication. It will, we end up with all sorts of, of duplication and, and nuancing. And it's still hard to analyze large volumes of text data and code it properly. Um, several years ago, I was working on an adverse event system for, for some big pharma. I, I think it was true here in the States, just as it was in Europe. Uh, GSK had Siroxat, one of the very, very common SSRIs for treating depression. And um, over the first five to 10 years of its use, we've got discovered a real problem of what's called suicide, suicidal ideation in adolescents and young adults. And actually, the suicide rate in, those, uh, in that population group goes up if you give them um, Siroxat. Now, the data is there. When GSK went back to their original trials and looked at the text, the data that this drug is, at, is a risk for, for adolescents um, and young adults, it's there. But they hadn't coded it, they hadn't used their terminology correctly to be able to find it, publish it, and say, look, you know, this is a great drug, but not for this group. So again, terminology is so valuable to us if we use it properly. Nothing is certain but death and taxes. Um, that's a quote from Daniel Defoe. But change is also an absolute certainty. And with thanks to Lisa, um, when I was talking with her about this, um, it's the clouds and mountains. Moving mountains is really complex and really expensive. But clouds are designed to move. And that's actually why we, t we have terminology. Terminology is designed to deal with those things that change and change rapidly. Um, and that's in really important to remember when you're using IGs. In order to manage our terminology properly, that change has to be managed in a governanced way. We are really poor at doing that. So although terminology is there to manage the change, we don't, in a sense, manage the use of that well. We spend a lot of time building our resources, arguing about the definitions of them. We spend far less time working through management of the terminology that's going to populate it and how and when that's going to change. One of the reasons I think um, terminology is, oh, bother, I knew I'd get stuck with this. Um, can, be, can be deemed either too simple, and we don't give it enough attention, or too hard, so it's like, oh, I just can't do that. Just give me some codes. Um, it's because terminologists themselves, of which I, I suppose I have to call myself one, mystify things. You know, are we talking about code systems, classifications, ontologies, vocabularies, dictionaries? How many names can you have for this one thing that I'm calling terminology? And what we're really about is studying the terms, the bits of data that you want to populate particular fields in your IGs with. So how are we managing those bits of data in a way that you can always know what they are, always know where to, the, to look them up, and manage if you need to add new bits of data to them? That's all about terminology. 
So we're dealing with the, the units of thought, the bits of data. We're dealing with the relationships between those bits of data, particularly if you want to be able to say in your IG, I want this one and all its more granular bits of data that go with it. You need to understand the relationships. And you also need to understand when relationships add definition to your bits of data in the terminology, not in the resource. And the terms that go with those bits of data. Because so often we have one, particularly in English, uh, it's not so bad in some other languages, but we have uh, four or five words that actually all mean pretty much the same thing. And people argue, oh, are they nuanced, are they not? Um, so it's the terms, the words and phrases in what, whichever language we choose. And then providing the codes for the machine processing of those concepts. This is one of my bugbears. Doing this well is not cheap. Terminology costs, even if you or your users are not paying for it directly. And please be respectful of that when you are writing your IGs. Please, you know, I will reiterate this probably several times. Attribute make uh, to the code system owner. If if licenses are involved, you know, have a big thing at the beginning. It's this one, this one, this one, this one. Please be respectful of the people that are putting resource into doing this well. And and please do encourage those who are doing this well. It's it can be a Cinderella subject. So a terminology is this body of terms that we can use in a particular area. Um, and you know, these are the standard examples that we have. Can anyone give me a, a quick definition, or a quick summary of the difference between terminology and master data? Anyone going to risk it? Right. <laughs> Not least because we'd have to run around with the microphone, I've discovered. If in your application and then in your message, you need to talk about the organization that is providing the care for a patient, and you have a list of 20 hospitals identified over with you know, 001, 002, 003, good health hospital, poor health hospital, very poor health hospital. Is that a code system? Or is it master data? Jose is very clear it's master data. I agree with him. I'm identifying real world things, single real world things. I might be doing so with a code, but actually, it's an identifier, really. And this, there's a, a line, a conceptual line in the sand. But master data, you should be able to identify an exact real world thing. Each of your laptops, obviously, has a GUID that says that this is a real world thing. But we can write a code system for, well, it's, it's an Apple laptop. It's a Livono laptop. It's that instance, real world thing versus kind. And terminology is all, all about describing rather than identifying. It's giving a code to a term that describes something rather than giving an identification to a single real world thing. That should already always be worked out in the resources that you're writing implementation guidance for. But it's worth checking, because that can slip by. OK, next section. This should be revision for everybody. Um, but as I said, I, I'm not going to, um, I don't want to skip over it. I love this diagram. It came from a, a terminologist in the UK NHS some 30 years ago. Um, and it is, it's, you know, the little man thinking. A concept, it's a piece of data. It's the thing that your terminology is identifying. And it can be a real thing like pneumonia. It can be a very abstract thing 
like love, but it's an atomic unit of thought. And how atomic is atomic? That's one of the key questions when we're collecting data, when we're building value sets. How granular, how atomic do you need to go for your use case? You know, when I started learning science in secondary school, there were atoms and there were molecules. And then two years later, we looked at atoms and they split to neutrons, protons and electrons. By the time you did uh, A-level physics, gosh, we got all sorts of subatomic particles. Everything can be made more granular. What is the unit of thought you need for your use case? And how will it relate to other units of thought? And these are abstract. They should be language independent. The context independent one is an interesting one, and we will come on to that later. But if this is something you'd like to explore, I really recommend Steven Pinker's book, The Language Instinct. It's written for linguists, but it's about semantics. It's about how we think about data in, um, in everyday life, but it has enormous applications in computer science. So that concept can be labeled with a code. That is the SNOMED code for an apple, believe it or not. And that code is machine processable. And it is published by the author of a code system as part of the code system. It hasn't come out of thin air. SNOMED's put a lot of time and effort into describing an apple. Actually not, but for many things within SNOMED, there's a lot of time and effort gone into it. And that code should be the single preferred unique identifier for that code in the code system. I'm going to come on to the whole thing about, uh, in the Semino uh, Desiderata, about the types of identifiers that we use. I must have pressed a button wrong. Phew. <laughs> um, it is best if they are meaningful. And then we can put a designation on it. Well, that's easy, that's Apple, but heck, it's exact, you know, it's different five letters, but that's the French, that's the Spanish. We could actually do it with symbols, a lovely symbol for an Apple. Um, that used to be really rare in healthcare, but, you know, think of icons and emoticons now. We use them all the time, and particularly if you're in clinical research, you're gathering patient data from the patient rather than from the healthcare professional. We use these symbols loads. And I think that's something to um, be fairly careful about. I think I've got another slide about this, because symbol, I think, has a different meaning uh, in, in some places in the fire spec. But in terminology, a symbol is just another type of designation. It's the thing that gives the con transmits meaning from one human to another, whereas the code transmits meaning from one computer to another. It can actually be multimedia. It could go beyond a symbol. And depending on your code system, you can have lots of designations for one particular code, one particular unit of thought. Synonyms, different languages, um, different pictures. Uh, and that might be important in your choice of code system, but that also might be important in your choice of value set, how many of those you do or don't include. So in the old days, in core principles, <laughs> in the old days of HL7, which we still adhere to, um, these things were put together into something called the concept representation. So here's my concept, which I can define and I can put in relationships. And I have representations of that, the designations which are human understandable and the codes that are machine processable. So if those are our basic things to try and communicate data from our brains to other brains or from the system to the other system. How are we going to do that? 
we've got to build collections of those concept representations. And that's what a code system does for us. But, you know, I'm going to harp on about this. Terminology is expensive. This is a managed collection. It's not a bucket. It's a managed collection. And sometimes it's got quite complex rules in it. But however, it is managed. And within that management, a single code should be unique for a single unit of thought. Even some of the very big code systems. Um, I, in my world, use the NCI thesaurus quite a lot. And that has an ontological backing to it, which should automatically compute equivalents. But heck, I can find things in there that I'm pretty sure I've got more than one code for a single unit of thought. And that's tough. So, and you can manage it through your value sets, but it's tough. So you've really got to look closely at how your code system is built because we really, really would like one code to one concept. And as I said, you know, we can give these things all sorts of names, but for our purposes of, of describing them in HL7 artifacts, they're all just code systems. A good code system should have a description of what it's trying to do for you. And we'll come back to that when we come to code system selection. Unless you're really weird, people don't build code systems for fun. They build them for a reason, for one or more purposes, hopefully several purposes. But that purpose should be described. So should the maintenance strategy. And it's really important that when you choose a code system to, um, to build your value sets in your implementation guides, that it matches or at least is compatible with, and I've said concept domain, this is not one, that the, the scope of the coded concept that you're trying to, to populate, it's really tempting to say, oh, that looks right, we'll use that. And it'll probably work for a couple of years. But trust me, two or three years down the line, it's like, oh, that scope's changed. The mismatch has got worse. Our data quality is getting poorer. Let's try and avoid that. You should also have a whole load of administrative information, such as its ownership and copyright and that will be important to reference. So in my little drawing, where I have my concepts, my concept representation, a code system does all of this for you. Identifying code systems in fire. This is the, the system attribute of the coding and coder concept coding and codable concept. And FIRE states that the choice of the correct URI for the system attribute is critical. And Julie says, unfortunately, this is easier said than done. And this is an area that in the HTA, we are the um, HL7 Terminology Authority, we are trying to work at to make this easier for you. But I'm sorry, this is just an awful lot easier said than done. <coughs> In the fire spec, there is an ordered list for code system identification, four different ways that you can identify a code system. And obviously, the URI is the critical or is the preferred, is the, the shall um, type way of doing that. Um, I haven't actually got any blue on this slide, but um, and it's very interesting doing this in front of Graham and Lloyd. You'll see in my slides every now and again, there's a, center, there's a, a bit in blue. The bits in blue are Julie's thoughts as opposed to um, 
the gospel. <laughs> and I haven't put any Julie's thoughts here, but my thoughts is actually, for me, the ordered list would start with this one, the URI published by the code system owner. That would be my thought. And the reason for that is to go right back to where we started. Terminology is expensive. Terminology needs to be properly governanced. The people doing that are the ones who should be giving out the, the, the URI. Because although I know you would love things never to change, the certainties of life are taxes, death, and So who's going to manage the change best? The people managing the code system. So Lloyd can shoot me later. Okay. <laughs> there is the fire code system registry, which I presume every single one of you here is familiar with. Nod your heads. Yes, wonderful. Um, so you know what it's doing. So this, in effect, is master data. And just like anything else, it's going to take effort and time to manage and keep up to date because everything changes. Um, and the provenance this information appears to be the vocabulary work group. Um, the more I'm delving into this, the more I'm personally thinking, gosh, we need to do some work here. So although I'm standing at the front speaking and maybe throwing the occasional rock, I'm actually throwing them back at myself. If this isn't good enough, why isn't it good enough? Julie, you claim to be a terminologist. So I would like to say that I think things hopefully will be getting more robust, getting clearer. The process for managing these um, might be improving. And now I'm really going to push the boat out. There's also the Fire Community Code System Registry. This is my comment on that. This feels to me like a bucket. Shall we move on? OK, so I've said that there is nothing certain but death taxes and change. Code systems should evolve over time. That's what they're there for. And changes occur because, shout them out, why do we have change? Knowledge. New, knowledge. New knowledge, which involves correcting old mistakes. Anything else? Unfortunately, the meaning of terms changes over time, probably because of new knowledge. And that's a hard one to manage. It's, what, it's one of the things that you know, terminologists go gray over. So we have to correct. We have to clarify. We have to understand that knowledge evolves. You know, classic, new countries emerge. Old countries are absorbed, you know, something that big. Never mind new genes and new diseases. And the relationships between things change as the knowledge changes. So it's not just that we get new concepts. You know, we just used to be able to say flu virus, and nobody had ever heard of N1, H1N1. Um, and, and then, you know, you've got subtypes of H1N1. So the new parent-child relationship comes up. And that's particularly important to go back to our you know, value sets and your debate of whether you want intentional or extensional. You know, how much do you want to absorb that new knowledge? What's important to your use case? So we've got all of these things happening, particularly in healthcare, all of the time. In my world, new medicines come out. I mean, it's not weekly anymore. But um, new medicines come out about every month. But new generics, new manufacturers doing uh, old stuff, changes daily. In the US, drug, uh, companies make money producing 
um, terminology for medicines that is updated daily. In the UK, we only bother to do it once a month. But you know, change happens. And that's why we version our code systems. And depending on how well the, the code system obeys these magical semino desiderata, will depend on how they manage change. And you know, we do have changes in meaning sometimes. And if that's important to your use case, and particularly if your code system doesn't obey the semino desiderata of concept permanence, you must state which version of a code system is going to be used. Uh, we had a, an enormous debate in SNOMED recently where we were going to change the meaning, I mean the meaning, of something like 400 concepts without changing the code. You've had this question many times, I'm sure. Um, so things like heavy smoker, well, back in the day, in the 1970s, a heavy smoker might be one thing, right? Nowadays, it's a different thing. Relatively speaking, you know, what's a heavy smoker? A former smoker doesn't have much of a definition associated with it, and uh, people use that term in different ways um, and in different levels of detail. So the code didn't change, the definition didn't change, but the understanding changed. Comment? <laughs> Comment. Happy. Happy to comment. Wrote an entire thesis on what current medication actually means. That, that's my doctoral thesis. <laughs> um, I go back to my slide with Stephen Hawking and motor neurone disease and what we as humans can do and what our machines can do. And recognizing the limits of what an unquantified term might mean, even though it carries a quantifiable adjective with it, is, is a skill that we just have to accept. I will tell you what I did for current medication over the course of nine years. I researched the evidence for what current might mean or should mean in a set of defined use cases. And then I drew an information model to define in machine processable terms what that currency actually is. Can you do that for every quantified term? Oh, no. I think you can possibly do it for ones that are important. Otherwise, we're back to hey, for the moment, we're still human. Yeah, I, I mean, you can push on the, what, what the definition of current means, but when it's coded, what did it mean to the person? I can't. You know, and that is an instinct with your thesis, because, you know, like mine, probably uh, myself and my advisor wrote, uh, read it, and that's it. Yeah. Well, actually, no, but we'll, we'll go there. Um, I think that's where we really need to understand the limitations of our terminology and where you writing your implementation guides and if you are going to select concepts like that, you have to understand what their value is going to be. And if your use case is going to be communicating from one care provider to another, point to point, that might be acceptable because you are sharing a common culture of understanding. Culture of understanding. If your use case is going to be uh, epidemiology, I would suggest that's probably not a good concept to put in your value set because you know that you want to gain, you're going to want to do quantifiable mathematics on it. So unless you uh, are willing to actually put additional uh, context around that, that would not be a code I would choose for my value set in that context. And that, I'm afraid, is the only way I think we can go at the moment. For your heavy smoker one, uh, some code systems will actually 
put a textual term and in the definition say um, 20 to 40 cigarettes or equivalent a day, which snowman does. Others don't. Look at your context. What do you need to do? What can you get away with? And how much effort are you willing to put into it? Terminology costs. Are you going to talk more about versions, or should we take up versioning now if we want to talk more about that? Am I going to, am I going to talk more about versioning? No, go for it, Graham. So code that. system versions is a very difficult subject. Um, so my experience is with SNOMED in Australia, where we publish specifications on a four to five year time frame. We fix the SNOMED version in the specification before the specification is actually in production for most systems, it's now illegal to use the specification because the SNOMED licensing says you can only get so far behind. And so nobody can actually conform to the specification and meet their SNOMED licensing conditions. So that's kind of fun. So we say, well, you should use the latest SNOMED version. And then we get to this question of concept meaning and permanence and, and people roll over their SNOMED version without actually rolling over their SNOMED version, or even if they roll over their SNOMED version, actually change their SNOMED codes, they don't go and revisit all the codes that they're already using. So they just change in meaning underneath them without them noticing. So this is kind of fun in practice. So that's one set of things for consideration with code system version. Do you want me to go there first, or do you um, want to pile it all on? Well, we can, you can comment on that, sure. I don't think terminologists engage with the real world enough. I don't think that we, at the moment I think possibly I'm the only one standing here, have enough understanding of what we think is perfection compared to what is pragmatically possible in the real world. And I think that we need to, at a real practical level, engage with these issues more deeply because I am sure you have been saying that to SNOMED for some time, Graham. I never said it to SNOMED. I just bitched to the Australian people You just about bitched it. to the Australians. OK, well, you need to bitch at a different level. Well, I mean, it's, well, this, the licensing... It's a licensing issue. issue. It's a licensing issue. But, but is it wrong for SNOMED to try and push people to stay current? I thought it was more a specification issue than a SNOMED issue, that one. I think it's... When you are using a a terminology that is as complex as SNOMED to use, and any of you who've tried to put it in real systems for users to cho choose codes from within an eight-minute consultation, you will know how difficult it is to use. Just, people don't use a complex code system. They might happen to be using SNOMED, but they're not using it in a complex fashion. Because they're just ref setting it. Yeah. Um. But every time you ref set, each version that comes out, you have to remanage that ref set. That is expensive. No. You know what really happens. Yeah, I didn't say that. <laughs> so I, I argued that we should not use, we should ban code system version across the board because we were just wasting money on it. So, so but that's, anybody can pick the flaws in that argument as well. So, it, so that's the first set of problems. So just, just back to that. It depends on your use case. <laughs> if you're doing analysis, it's really fair to fix a code system version. Wow. You know, if I take you to, um, to clinical trials for our medicines that we all need to use, when you license a medicine, when you do your clinical trials, you fix your MEDRA code, you, you fix your MEDRA version for the duration of your set of clinical trials, or you state that you're going to do one or two updates. Different world, but an absolute fix. Well, I'll let Mike go and then I'll say, yeah. 
I don't know. The one case I can think of is not otherwise specified. It's very contextual in the version of the code system, right? You've oh. got to know the version to know what not otherwise specifies mean. Just don't use it. Actually, you need to know the version of the value set, yes. not the code system. Yeah, I mean, this is a real issue. I've just been through the New Zealand GP to GP implementation guide, revising all the SNOMED content in it to align with the New Zealand edition of SNOMED. Lovely job. But you've got to look at all the legacy data. I've had to write a big appendix of saying, well, all these codes have subsequently been deactivated, but they, you know, it doesn't mean they're incorrect. I've just had to point out on, and when we've got model meaning bindings to some of those deactivated terms. But you can't go and rewrite the past. No. You've got clinical, clinically coded data that's, that's using those concepts. And that addition may have been deprecated or you're not licensed to use it, but that doesn't affect the, and change the fact it has been used in practice. And that's the big issue. And it so much depends on what you are trying to do. If I am trying to communicate meaning from one clinician to another for a single point of care, actually, I want to know exactly what he's, he or she said at the time. And so I want to use the old version, and I need to know which version he, chose it, he or she chose it from. If I'm trying to keep things going so that everything so that I'm fulfilling my license then I've got a whole set of different problems and I think where why I say we need the interaction between is because the reason SNOMED wants to push you there the reason the licensing agreement is as it is is because they're trying to get everybody to be using new knowledge mm. but you know that that's the discussion that needs to be had at, at, a, at a really fairly high but practical level, which is in a sense why I'm going through this fundamental stuff, so that you are actually properly enabled to stand up there and have that argument, uh, because it's quite easy for people to um, use a set of words that sort of you come away with and say, well, I think I understand that, and their reasoning for why we up version was sensible, but now I've come away about it and thought about it for half an hour. Actually, I'd like to go back, and you've missed your opportunity. When you asked earlier about things that were on our mind, I forgot to say that. Legacy codes is something that we're really struggling with right now. And um, gentlemen, I'm sorry, I don't know your name, but who's just going through that, Peter, going through that exercise. Rob McClure and I really have scratched our heads around we're starting to run into legacy codes, and we're not even really sure when a code system version deprecates a code and we have to keep it around because it's been used in value sets in the past. They ask you what version of the co code system this legacy code comes from, and it's confusing to know, well, do we need to mention it from this ver you know, n, n minus one, n minus two, n minus three, or is there something implied that if I just stick it in the list of legacy codes once from n minus one, that it would imply that it would also be a valid legacy code from any of these other earlier versions of the code system? And it so much depends on your use case, your business use case. Graham. That's right, it's really good that you have lots of different use cases with incompatible answers. Then you do. Um, well, for s the, the next thing I wanted mm -hmm. to just to move a little bit further on versions is um, if you ask the vocabulary experts about how well well known code systems Sorry. adhere to the um, permanence definitions in the Semino Disrata, you'll get a wide variety of answers for a given code system um, depending on how well informed about the extremely fine details individuals are. So, so that's a, a significant challenge. So, so I'm pushing on this because the, one of the most important things that you do when you're writing an implementation guide is bind to terminology. Yep. And, and this subject of versions is where the rubber hits the road and where you find out the perceptual differences between the pure terminologists and the system engineers and the clinicians, and you're caught smack bang in the middle of it. I, what are we hoping for from this session is to grow a group 
that that actually exists in that middle, which yes. is kind of what Julie talked about before. But it's, it's always seemed to me that versioning is it's the and to deciding should you use a version, which version should you use, where how should you version the instance and the definitions. That's the thing that catalyzes the actual discussion that matters. That's why I chose to push on versions. So I take you from one of your comments about you get different answers from different people. I take you back to my 10,000 hours. This stuff is not actually that easy. And I know you want it to be fast, and I know you want it to be reasonably simple. It isn't. We didn't want it to be fast or simple. We might have accidentally got fast in the name, but nobody <laughs> believes that. It does seem like a place you always say you, can, you can't get rid of complexity, you can just push it somewhere else. And this seems like a place that you just can't push the complexity anywhere else. You're just stuck with it here. And this is the wasteland in the middle of the complexity shifting. Yep, and hey, this is the Cinderella place where all the soot and the dirt is. I'm willing to sit in that place. I don't have all the answers. I have nearly the 10,000 hours of experience and some of the scars, like those SNOMED codes that changed their meaning. And actually, I went back to SNOMED and said, please don't do that. So they changed back again in the following following six months, and I was in a group of terminologists that argued for 45 minutes in a big international meeting about that change. And after 45 minutes, I said, and is anyone using those? <laughs> and the discussion went on for another five minutes. And then I said, and is anyone using those? And in the end, there was silence. And I said, so shall we just go forward? So I'm willing to engage in the dirt and the space. And I'm not talking a lot about code system versions and this whole thing about legacy. But um, we started early. So when I get to the end, shall we try and wing it? That's my offer. I, I, I'm happy I've said what I wanted to say about versioning. I am assuming that everybody is very familiar with the fire code system resource, the thing that declares the existence of a code system and all its key metadata, and optionally defines all a part of its content. So it has this key identifying thing, the URL, and the version and all of this other set of um, metadata. And what concept properties are defined by the code system? The relationships, the attributes, the, um, the different types of terminology relationships that, um, the concept, that the code system allows the concepts to have. And the sorts of filters or properties that you can use when you compose a value set. And in addition, it can list some or all of the concepts of the code system. Now, I mentioned there were bits in blue. This is one of them. I think this risks making the code system resource a bit schizophrenic. It's trying to do two things, one of which is mandatory, tell you the absolute things you need to know, the identification and the key metadata. But actually, you, all, you, you get a whole lot. Um, including the ability to extend beyond what the code system as managed by the code system owner provides in the extension. So, you know, a bit of Julie there, just looking at that and saying, mm, not so sure. Right. Um, I want to do this bit, and then I think we'll stop for some coffee, and uh, you can come and attack me and, with all the things I'm not saying or saying wrong. The value sets. Sorry, I want to go back there a minute. We've sp we've, all that I've done so far have been, has been here. And I'm, all of the things from code systems 
can go into a value set and then you, uh, after coffee, will talk about the absolute key bit, which is the binding to some, or some type of information model. So it is literally the link between the code system and the information model, which in our case is, is the element of a fire resource. And it's without that, it, this is what makes it real. This is why, in a sense, exemplar bindings are only exemplar. It's, it's when you get to the actual value set that we're in reality. And I think it's why Graham said, well, never mind the code system version, it's the value set version that's, that's more important. The value set is the thing that um, works for your resource. Code system can work for any resource. The value set works for your resource. So it is that uniquely identifiable set of valid concepts that you can use at a specific point in time, which of course goes into this whole thing about legacy and whatever the discussion we've just had previously. And we tend to always think about value sets in terms of information model binding, putting them into a resource. But actually we use value sets in analysis an awful lot, as actually the fire queries are, are doing. A pick list in a drop down on a UI is pretty nearly a value set if it's dealing with terminology. And obviously, we use it as, as in query parameters. But don't forget that when you're writing an IG, particularly if you're thinking about communication, system designers may well put it into a pick list. And a value set is delineated by this wonderful thing called a value set definition, which is. Um, referenced there. And then it's expressed by the expansion, the actual set of codes that are valid for that spot in a point of time. That's the expansion. The definition exists almost separate from time, whereas the value set expansion, the enumerated list, exists at a single point in time. So you're going from the, the eternal to the now. I have to um, confess that I've been involved in some of this value set definition, which, you know, when you come to meaningless identifiers, this was always VSD, value set, value set definition. Every time my husband heard it, he heard um, ventral septal defect, because that's one of the things that he has in his heart. So every time I was doing a conference call on VSD, he was going, what are you, what are you doing? <laughs> Oh, we love our three-letter three acronyms, even, even person to person. So this part of it is actually all about the metadata of a value set. And then um, the content logical definition, this bit here, is how we describe the list of codes that actually make up the value set, and we describe them in a sense in an eternal way, and then when you process them at a point of time, you make them real. There is a type code here, and this is where we just say whether this is instantional, so it's algorithmically defined, and it will be dynamically updated, depending on the rules that you've set in this complex thing. Um, and it usually requires some sort of terminology exferver to give it the expansion. And the terminology server can be anything as complex as an Apple on CTS through to an Excel spreadsheet. How many of you are managing your terminology in an Excel spreadsheet? Thank you, I've certainly done that. It's okay. <laughs> When it comes to versioning. By you know, I mean, it's really hard to do this without at least dumping your value sets into Excel and working with them that way. It's possibly the only way to do it a tool. It, I always end up having to use Excel. I don't know. I'd be surprised if anybody doesn't at least do some management of their value sets in Excel. Isn't sure. Yes. I think I manage nearly all of my value sets in Excel. Isn't that sad? 
that we're using a statistical tool to manage our value sets. And how many of you have codes that have leading zeros? How many of you have had your value set corrupted by the fact that Excel tried to take your SNOMED 64-bit int and do it? Isn't that sad? Aren't we in the Cinderella world? <laughs> I, when UK general practitioners started looking at their own data, they were actually given tools to extract their data from their systems themselves to do their own queries. They dumped them in Excel spreadsheets. And before anyone realized what Excel, particularly for the national extension codes, which are the long ones, before anyone realized we were getting all sorts of screwy data as Excel was changing, never mind the terminology changing the meaning of our concepts, Excel changed the meaning of our concepts. <sighs> or you can have your enumerated list that's managed directly. It's more constrained, but it's possibly going to cause you more grief in the long term, as um, Lisa has been talking about with your mapping and so forth. Then this is the CLD, the content logical uh, definition. As I said, this, it would take a, a whole class to go through it. Um, since we did it about 18 months ago, I think I'd have to really refresh my brain to be able to go through it. But I'm willing to give it a go if you've got key questions. There are parts of it that I guess we will use time and time again, and parts of it that we'll almost never use unless you're into some really complex stuff but it would be wise to be familiar with it, uh, particularly if you're needing to build complex value sets. Value set identification in FHIR is all around the value set ID. And the value set URL. And that should, the, the value set ID is the logical ID in this, of the system that holds the value set, so it's what you'll see in the, the domain resource, whereas the value set URL is the canonical URL. It'll never change. It should be the same in every copy. It's the literal location of the master version of the value set, if that's a possible thing to do. And there's also then the value set identifier, um, which contain um, a, a system pair value, as in the old sort of HL7 version 3 OIDs. The fire value set resource, the thing that communicates information about one value set to another, uh, from one system to another, is based on that CLD. And it's um, a very complex resource as the CLD was a, quite a complex um, UML diagram. I have suggested, well, I probably should have put this in, view, in blue, because this is, again, Julie's thoughts. I suspect you're not writing value set definitions in this level, although, Melvi, you said you were using a tool yesterday in the training. Is it going to this level of... Um, but it will be based on this definition. So we may need to go into this a bit more detail later. I hope not, because I'm not very good so, at it. Oh, Graham's got up on his feet. What have I done wrong? Well, it's not so much that. Um, I mean, anyone who's writing an IG is going to write a value set. And anyone who's going to write a value set is either going to use XML or JSON or a value set editor. But the value set editors come back to this concept model, and you have to work with that. But what we, uh, we did a little bit on the actual technical value set stuff yesterday, and, and the more the focus here isn't really to dive into the technical value set stuff as you know choice and understand which is stuff you're focusing on, so that's fine. Phew, because I'm not very good at this. And then we've got the value set expansion which 
I think would primarily be used for, by, um, for a terminology server. But as Lisa said, when you're actually working out what the expansion is, first off, I'm going to be putting it in an Excel spreadsheet. We're a little bit early. We said coffee at 10, 10.30. If it's there, I'd like to stop now, because that's all, in a sense, the theory. That was all, to my mind, the fundamentals. I, and we've got a bit more theory, in, in a sense, in the Semino Desiderata, but those are looking very practically at how you're making your choices. So although it's written in, a, in an academic paper, what we're looking at is how we apply that. So that's, that's much more practice. So in a sense, I think we've, we've done the theory. Let's stop and have coffee. <laughs>